Oh my god. Are we live now? Yeah. Oh, how's my hair? Good. All right. Hello, hello, check. I believe we're live. Let me see. I'm just waiting to get this because I'm monitoring. There we go. Cool. All right. Maybe I should get the cream candy. Look. Oh, just take it down to the boards. Yeah, it's not no fuss, no muss. Um, I like the no fuss, no muss thing. Sometimes, you know. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, all right. Good afternoon or good morning. Good morning. It's technically morning here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not sure where you're listening from, but good morning to you wherever you are. Um, welcome to our weekly interview and concert series. Um, today we have the good fortune of having the tremendous bassist and composer and educator, all around great guy, and also longtime bassist with the Kingston Trio. I know he doesn't like to necessarily broadcast that but phenomenal musician this is paul gaberson paul thank you for joining us thank you yeah um and i don't mean to be rude i'm i'm monitoring the I'm, it's just me here today doing this normally there's someone else helping us but um so i'm kind of looking at my phone to monitor this so if you have questions for paul or myself during the course of this interview um, feel free to put uh, comments in here and i will do my best to uh, address them and if we can sometimes the system isn't perfect but we'll do our best and we can also do it after the fact so if, if we don't catch it live during the live stream we can we can go in after this is done and and respond to you so please don't be shy um just write your questions on a hundred dollar bill. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right. Well, Paul, can you talk a little bit about um, you've had a uh, at, at this point a massive career in music and still much more to do. Can you talk about how you got started playing? Um, oh, okay. Well, uh, I when I was a kid, I I loved. Uh, I mean, I loved music from the beginning, like we all do, you know. And uh, there was a. I mean, it was kind of. It was kind of silly, but when I was uh, in second grade, uh, or first between first and second grade, I can't remember, uh, we got a Beatles album for Christmas for all the kids, my parents. And, uh, of course, it was Beatlemania at the time. And uh, so uh, I was, you know, we were all jumping around listening to music, and um, I, uh, I noticed that the bass player's name was Paul. And I was I was crazy about it, so I said, "I'm going to be a bass player." Because when he wants to take a break from the the Beatles, then I can sub for him. <laughs> so, in essence, I've become the ultimate sub for other bass players because that was my destiny in the beginning was to be the sub for Paul McCartney because we had the same name at least. Yeah. Little did I know that uh, I would never be able to follow in those giant footsteps that he uh, that he is. <coughs> As a, as a great music, not only as a as a, somebody named Paul, but somebody who uh, wrote some of the world's greatest music, and you know, so. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of how I got started. So I started, um, you know, everybody kind of entertained me a little bit. There wasn't a lot of money for musical instruments and stuff. I had a little ukulele, and so we. Um, uh, I used to spend time uh, making cardboard cutouts of Beatle basses like Paul McCartney's, and uh, I would draw strings on them and, and put a little string and hang it around my shoulder and jump around and play. Only uh, my brothers were quick to note that he was left-handed. And I said, well, you know, nobody's going to notice. I'm, I'm right-handed, so that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, and then uh, when we, uh, we got to uh, grade school, I mean, when in fourth grade, they uh, had uh, – they had a thing uh, at our elementary school. In fourth grade, you could join orchestra. And, um, and then fifth grade, you could join band. And uh, I think the possibility of being a drummer. So a lot of my friends were like, I'm waiting because I'm going to play drums. You know, mo most kids, they, you know, you go to a band room and there's like 18 drummers and then there's a couple clarinet players and, you know, one bass player maybe or a guitar player that you have to talk into playing bass. <laughs> but everybody wants to play drums. So I, I was like, I don't care about the drums. I'm going to play the bass. So uh, I went there, and I was, you know, too small. But, but uh, the orchestra director, uh, Robert McNamara, um, he in Puyallup, Washington, uh, he, was, he was great. And uh, so he, had, he gave us this aptitude <laughs> test, which, which I thought was great. I got I scored like a perfect score on this aptitude musical aptitude test, and of course I talked to Bob McNamara about it years later. 
uh, not not ten years ago or something like that. I uh, <coughs> and I was telling you know, remember that test you gave us for the for the music uh, uh, aptitude thing, and I go and I and the, my mom was so excited that I scored so well and she got me into the music program and everything. And he goes, yeah, you know if you can if you can see lightning and you can hear thunder, you can get into the orchestra. And I go, oh, okay, I didn't realize it was that easy, but thanks for, you know, crushing my <laughs> beginning in music. So I started on the violin, which I didn't like, and then the next year, um, my parents gave the okay to, to play cello, and I think that the school had a cello or they rented a cello or something, so I played that for a year and in fifth grade. And besides spending all my time getting in trouble and getting having to sit out in the hall, uh, in class and stuff, I was I had a cello that I carried around. Now, I don't remember if I practiced much or anything, but my I was waiting for the bass. So in sixth grade, I was big enough, and they gave me a half size bass or whatever it was at the time, and uh, I studied uh, bass with this woman. Uh, I had I can't remember her first name, but the last name was Waller. And she had a couple daughters that were in school with us. And uh, so she uh, uh, was my first kind of bass teacher. And, and, and Robert McNamara, Bob, was also a bass instructor. But he was, you know, he was up to his neck in kids. He was teaching at, s I think, several, uh, several grade schools and at the junior high and at the high school. So he, he was a traveling uh, music teacher in the Puyallup School District, and he did that pretty much his whole career. So he was there when I got to junior high. He was there when I went to high school, um, and <coughs> uh, so I started playing bass. And and I I think that uh, my goal at the time was I wanted to play the electric bass. So I really wanted to be. Uh, I really still had this electric bass vision, you know. I was, you know, seventh grade. I'm not. By the time I got to seventh grade, I was, you know, this is what I want: electric bass. You know, my dad was my dad uh, was a research scientist, but he was really into classical music, and he would bring home lots of classic uh, recordings of the like Tokyo String Quartet playing Bartok and. And uh, I remember we had uh, a, a Rimsky Korsakoff, uh, Scheherazade, and so I loved that. And uh, but he was like, if you want a bass guitar, you got to show some proficiency on upright because that's the instrument that came before bass guitar. And uh, and I'm like, okay. So I started learning how to do some stuff. But one of the ways that I could was like, you can either practice or you can play bass for the CYO group at All Saints Catholic Church where we went to went to church and they had a CYO group where the the band sat up there and went dun da dun da 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 dun da dun da with a typical folk music and uh, guitar stroke which I you know I was like do you guys know another do you guys know do you guys know another even at that age I was like is there another guitar stroke that you know they didn't but so I started playing, you know, barely any bass. But I was, I, 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 I put in my due diligence. And so my dad took me up to Myers Music in Seattle, Washington, and got me a bass guitar. And the first thing I saw was this, this really cool jazz bass that was used. Uh, and I really wanted it. And, but somebody had taken the finish off with a rasp, so it was really ugly. And my dad said, there's no way we're buying buying that because it's used and it's uh, you know it's in really poor shape. And I go, yeah, but it's cool. This is what I want. It's something really cool. But he ended up buying me a Vox copy of a Beetle bass, which I thought was at the at the time I was young enough that I I so, sort of just got over my uh, <coughs> uh, whatever I. I got over it quick because I had an electric bass in my hands, you know, and uh, it had a distortion switch, so that was cool, you know. But I didn't, I wasn't playing jazz at all at the time. I didn't even, 
I had no idea. So I played in, uh, in, in junior high. They had a, uh, a little pep group, I think. And there was another girl there that played bass too, and she had a, what they call, Fender had a uh, six string bass, which are, they're kind of valuable now. And her parents bought, th bought her that. I think her dad was a dentist or something. I was a little envious. <laughs> and I, I, so I had this Vox bass, but I had the distortion switch. So everybody, all the kids thought that was really cool. Yeah. Hey, turn on that, turn on that switch, you know. <laughs> you know, you're all kids. You know, they, so we're just bopping all over the place. And, uh, um, but I was still playing upright. I was still in orchestra through junior high. Got to high school, I was still in orchestra. There was a few few guys that were actually knew how to practice, and they were they were much better. So you grew up in Puyallup. So which high school did you attend? Was Puyallup High. Puyallup High. Okay. Yeah. The Vikings. Go Vikings. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, go Vikings for my uh, my niece's husband, Pat Ellison, who's who's a huge Vikings fan. But <coughs> uh, anyway, um, so. Uh, Fast forward through high school, finally got out of there, and um, I never, I started playing bass guitar again, and then I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And finally, I, I was, uh, I ended up at Green River Community College for some reason, and uh, was studying uh, just basic and breadth requirements uh, to get, a, to, so I could move on to a four-year degree somewhere. And I, I noticed that Green River had a, a pretty good drama department, and they had a, uh, a good, they had some good music stuff. Uh, Pat Thompson ran this thing called the, the Music Company, Green River Music Company. I was never in it, but they were really good. And so I was like, wow, this is really cool. I'm gonna, um, and I knew how to play piano, too. So I started, uh, I went up to them, and I got a, a job teaching piano for, for uh, class piano and stuff like that. And that, that, that was like a work study thing, make some money. But then I started taking music uh, theory. Uh, and uh, finally I said, um, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do uh, next year. What do you think I could do? And somebody said, well, uh, Central Washington University, or at the time it was called uh, uh, Central Washington State College. And, and uh, I said, somebody said they had a good music program. And I go, really? And they go, okay, so I went over there and I talked to a woman named Maria Drunks who was a cello bass teacher. And uh, <laughs> um, my, this is my illustrious beginning. So I, I, uh, uh, I talked to her and they needed, they needed bass players, you know, just like a lot of places, you know. They may not need bass players as bad now, but then I don't think they had but uh, uh, anybody playing upright bass, maybe somebody else. But when I got to the, uh, so I talked to her and she agreed to let me, she just signed a paper and said, you're in. I didn't have to audition or anything. So I thought, oh, that's great. My dreams are coming true. You know, I, I get to be, because uh, by that time I, I thought the upright bass was really cool and I had been playing it, but I wasn't very good at it. So, um, uh, I went to school there and was in orchestra, started taking lessons, and um, heard some guys playing at some jazz. And I didn't know anything about it, uh, but uh, there, was a, there was a guy there, uh, Kelly Coons, who was playing bass. Uh, he was really good. And uh, he, at the time, he had already been uh, arranging uh, vocal choir arrangements and stuff. He was younger than me. Uh, which means he probably still is younger than me. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't believe it. He was like, not only uh, doing these arrangements, uh, he was also, uh, you know, they put up, uh, <laughs> remember they had the audition for the jazz, but I thought, well, I'll wander in there, you know. Uh, and somebody said, oh, you should try out. I'm like, well, I, I, I don't know, okay. Well, I guess I'll try out. Uh, and so they, the first chart they put up there was with Woody Herman chart called Wind Machine. And uh, <laughs> I was like, I, had, I don't know if I've ever seen that many notes in my life. And I, so I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I, I, um, I just struggled through it. And of course, you know, I, I'm sure there's car wrecks that sounded better <laughs> than that. Or whatever they say, you know. Yeah. And then Kelly got up there 
uh, with his bass, his electric bass, and he just read through it. He, I don't think he missed a note, and I, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was going, oh, man, I don't know. I, I wonder if there's another department in the school that I could get involved in because this is this is really embarrassing. And 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 there's some musicians in here that are really really good. And and although, uh, so I decided, well, I'll stick with it. Maybe I'll maybe I, I could learn something here. And uh, um, so Kelly was the bass player in the first band, and they actually got me to be the bass player in the second band. And Dave Bardin was. Uh, yeah. conducting the second band yeah. and um, so some guys started showing me some stuff and uh, there was a drummer named Ben Frommuth who uh, kind of gave it up and became a singer uh, and I hope he picked up drums again because he was he was amazing uh, he started playing records for me and then there was a few other people that had played records for me and I met a guy named Bruce Babbitt who's a a killing alto player and a good friend and he spent a bunch of time with me playing records so this is what we did in Ellensburg is I'd go over to people's apartments and or, or dorm rooms or whatever and they would play the records for me and of course we'd be you know there wasn't any much of anything else to do uh, we just listened to records and so this is kind of how I got started uh, so one year passes I you know, I don't know, I was okay. The second year passes, and then that, that uh, spring break came the, on the second year I was there, and everybody went home. And Ellensburg is like a ghost town on spring break. I mean, it's like uh, when all the students go away, it's back to a farming community of like 5,000 people or something. It was a pretty small town. And um, so I had the whole place to myself. So I spent the week uh, – transcribing and playing along with this album called Mel Lewis and Friends with Ron Carter and uh, uh, Hank, Hank Jones and Thad Jones. And Is that the one where Michael Brecker and Freddie yeah. Hubbard do uh, uh, Moose the Moosh? Moose the Moosh, Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting track. Yeah. But, uh, and so I fell in love with that album. I don't know, I must have got it from Bruce Babbitt. And uh, uh, so I tried, I took somebody's advice and I started transcribing the bass lines, uh, Ron's bass lines to all this stuff. And there was a blues in there called uh, Show Enough Did. And Ron plays this incredible uh, intro to it. So I just, tra I just transcribed the whole, I think the whole album. And I spent the week transcribing and playing along to this. And uh, that was kind of a, a breakthrough moment for me, was that album. Uh, and so... From that day, I've been a, a huge Ron Carter fan. And for a long time, you know, I was like trying to slink and slide and do all those Ronisms and stuff. Uh, but it really helped my playing. And by the time I got out of college, I, I was uh, flat broke and had no gigs. It was perfect. It was <laughs> Pre preparing you for 2021, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it was, I prepared me for what it just happened to us. And, and my brother, uh, my older brother, Mark, he was going to college to be an engineer. And when he got out, he had a full-time job, you know. And, of course, I had my parents going, look at your brother, Mark. He's got a full-time job, you know. He's making good money already, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, well, maybe I need to, to regroup here or something. I kept telling myself that. But then I got this, I got some opportunities to do some things. And uh, uh, it just kind of fed onto itself over the years. And I, st and I started following around some musicians in Seattle that I thought were really, really good. There was a bass player named Steve Allen. Uh, there was another bass player named Kerry Black. Uh, ch of course, Chuck Deardorff. I used to go and watch him play all the time at either Jazz Alley or some other places. I'd go watch Steve Allen. I think they would, they would trade off and... Uh, uh, and I got I got some gigs playing electric bass, and uh, eventually I got in this <laughs> this top forty band. It was, you know, I mean when you're when you're younger in your twenties and stuff, there's there's a lot of opportunities that come to you that won't come to you later in life. And so I was I was game for anything. So somebody said, hey, uh, I know this girl's trying to put a band together. Uh, uh, she's looking for musicians, and she sings backup 
with the tubes, which I loved the tubes at the time. They did uh, Talk to You Later and a few other hits, but they were kind of this crazy San Francisco band, and she, she was one of their backup singers. Uh, and so she was trying, her name is Michelle Gray, uh, wonderful person, and she, uh, she put this band together, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll play bass. I'm game for anything, you know. Uh, I wasn't a jazz bass player at the time. I mean, I, I, had, I didn't have a chance. There was, there was some guys in town or uh, women uh, that were way better than I was. So I, I uh, decided, okay, I'll do it. And so we, uh, there, they had three singers, Michelle and uh, uh, a girl named Kelly Harrison and uh, another woman named Jumi Amazawa, and not that that really matters. And uh, so we started rehearsing, and it was like, okay, well, that what's the what's the deal? Is there going to be, you know, what's the theme of the band going to be? What's going to be a top forty band? Okay, are, and how are we going to do it? Uh, well, we're going to we're going to copy the songs so they sound exactly like the record, because. Uh, that's fun. It's fun to do. I mean, it's fun to try to, to get things to sound exactly like they do on the record for some reason. Uh, it, it was fun for a while. And then after a while, I saw it, I, the jazz musician in me is like wanted to pull my hair out going, you know, we could add a solo here or we could, we could change the arrangement of this. And they go, that's not how it goes on the record. Well, I was like, okay. Um, so it didn't take me long for the, me to start irritating everybody in the band, because <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is a natural talent of mine. Is, so I, uh, um, uh, we had some really good musicians. Uh, Jay Kenny ended up playing piano, who was running a, uh, 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 I think he just closed it down, a, a, a recording studio called Audio Source, and he's a very good pianist. And he's, he's a, he's, he was, we went to, to check him out in this Top 40 band down in Renton. And he, by far, uh, of all the keyboard players we had listened to, he got these sounds that were just exactly like the records. Jay was, he was, he's, he's amazing on the, on the, on the uh, well, they were kind of like computers at the time, the, the Oberheims or the DX7 and whatever. And he knew, how, he knew, he knew how to break sound down and stuff, uh, much to, and everybody will agree that the people that have recorded at his studio and stuff, he's, 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 he's very good. And there was uh, a couple guys, Mike Mattingly. We had another drummer, but we ended up getting his, Mike's identical twin brother, Mark. They both, we both went to school together at Central. Uh, incredible musicians. So we had the four of us could make the, the, the records kind of sound like that. And then the, the women singers, uh, female singers or whatever, they were, they did their thing. They were beautiful and they sang. They had huge hair <laughs> because it was the 80s. So there was a lot of hairspray. It was really fun. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we ended up being a, a very popular group. And the only downside to it is they wanted to call it Boy Toy because this was the, the thing on Madonna's belt buckle. Yeah. Uh, and so Madonna was, uh, the queen of all pop music at the time, back in the 80s. And so I did that for a little while, and then Kerry Black came around. I'd, I'd been hanging out with him uh, before, and he was in, in doing some gigs with a, a group called Caravan, which was just a you know, bunch of jazz musicians trying to, to get work. And uh, um, so I knew these jazz musicians, and I had always kept in contact with them. And the boy toy thing was just a blip on the radar, but it didn't happen. It lasted for a little less than two years, I think. But the uh, Carrie came into one of our gigs, and and uh, I see him standing out there, and it was like a, you know, uh, somebody sticking out, like it's, it's something doesn't belong here. And it's that guy, <laughs> it's that guy down there. There's like all these crazy '80s people in, in a dance club, and there's this guy that that looks like he's, you know, salt of the earth, uh, real, real jazz musician, real, you know, where Carrie did all kinds of stuff. He was a fabulous bass player and he still, he still, is. still does. Yeah. Yeah. 
He still is. I think he moved to California. But, uh, and so he asked me if I wanted to sub with the Kingston Trio. And I'm like, I'm like, yes, of course. Uh, who are the Kingston Trio? <laughs> 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 but uh, so he gave me the, the tape, and uh, I knew every song. I'd known him from either my parents playing him or hearing him on the radio as a kid or whatever. And uh, I never did ask him why. Carrie, why did you want me to sub for you? Uh, I always thought maybe because he knew I wouldn't try to take his gig or whatever, you know. And maybe he, maybe, uh, maybe in the distance, uh, you know, he heard my cry for help, like wanting to get it, get away from the top 40 thing. So I did it. He, there was two weeks. One week was uh, at the Four Queens Casino, and then there was a week I was back playing with in Seattle with the Top 40 group, and then there was an, uh, another week where they traveled around a, a little bit. And uh, um, I liked the guys in the band; they were they were kind of crazy. It was a different different type of people that I'd never experienced before, and, and uh, um, so I. I did that for a couple weeks. On so the second week, I get this call from the guys in Boy Toy, and they're going, oh, yeah, we're, we're just going to keep the guy who's subbing for you to play bass. And of course, I was not so happy about that. But the guys in the Kingston Trio thought that was hilarious. <laughs> they thought it was funny <laughs> that I got fired from my gig to do their gig. So when uh, a year went by, uh, and then Kerry had mentioned that he was, he was going to go to Indonesia with his wife. Uh, who was uh, studying ethnomusicology at the University of Washington. So they went to Java. And so he was going to leave the group anyway. Uh, and so I said, okay, uh, I would do it if you go. Or I'll sub for you until you get back. I mean, I, I don't care. You know, whatever y you want to do. I mean, I wasn't chomping at the bit to take his gig from him, but I was, I was chomping at the bit to find a gig. Uh, and so... Um, when he finally, they asked for me back. They asked the Kings of Tri Bob Shane from the Kings of Trio asked if I wanted to, to do it. And of course I said yes. So um, uh, I took over for Kerry and uh, I think they went to Java for like six months or, or a year or something like that. Must have been a really cool experience. But um, uh, so I just kind of stuck with it. And it was... It was kind of crazy. I learned a lot about the music industry. I learned a lot about people. Um, I learned a lot about myself and uh, trying to get myself organized and stuff. Uh, it was it was quite a, a learning curve. But well, it was great because it gave me the time. It was only a part-time gig, so it gave me enough money to pay my rent, and I could practice and t study with people and, and go after the, the, the elusive... Uh, jazz music that I really wanted to do, but I needed it. I needed a job somehow, but I didn't want to pay houses. Or well, and you were playing with him. The, the tenure with that band is a very long one, and over the course of that tenure, you took on many different hats, from, and maybe I'm, I'm mistaken, but I thought, like, didn't you take over some of the booking responsibilities and, and oh, yeah, flights and travel of, arrangements? And well, guy, uh, yeah, uh, now, I did the, the Kings of Trio, I think this was in 88, 1988, uh, and uh, they had a uh, Bob Shane, who's the original member, and he had two other two other guys that could really sing great, uh, George Grove and Bob Hayworth, and um, n apparently Bob had an opportunity to get Nick Reynolds, the other one of the other original members. He was. He was uh, done with what he called my midlife retirement. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, after the Kingston Trio disbanded in 1967, Nick moved up to Southern Oregon, and they just, he, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a rock star at the time, so he didn't, he didn't have to work. He just had a ranch, and, you know, like a lot of rock stars or movie stars do, they go buy a ranch somewhere and live there for a while until they get bored of it, and then they come back to, to acting or they come back to music or whatever. And, yeah, I got tired of doing nothing, you know. Or uh, so uh, Nick came in the band like two two months later. So it was Bob Shane, Nick Reynolds, and George Grove. So it was kind of like 
the Kingston Trio uh, doing the Kingston Trio. And of course, I, I was an uh, impartial jury to this whole process because I wasn't a fan of the Kingston Trio at the time. But I did love I, I did love Bob and Nick. I thought they were they were they were characters that you didn't find in Seattle in the music scene. This was something that this was something out of a Hollywood movie. I mean, you, you, they they should have been actors. They were. It was incredible the charisma they had and uh, the the rapport they had with each other on stage was phenomenal. But it wasn't jazz, and and I and I knew that, and I but I also knew. Uh, I would probably never make a great living in jazz because there was already, uh, you know, I was already a little older and uh, there were guys that were younger than me, like Charnett Moffat and Christian McBride came along and, and guys that were just like phenomenal talents. And I knew that, uh, that I love the music. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play the music. Uh, but I'm going to stick with this gig because it's the thing. So a guy came up to me, uh, Alan Shaw, who ran a uh, started a record company called Rediscover Music, and it was in uh, Chicago, Naperville. And he every once in a while, when we played in the Chicago area, uh, he would show up uh, with a couple boxes of CDs or whatever or tapes, and he would sit out in the uh, lobby and sell them. Then we'd come back and give Bob Shane a big wad of cash, and then he would leave. And then, of course, Bob is just like, <laughs> shove it in his pocket, and you know. And I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting, you know, because I, I never, as a musician, uh, I was just watching, and I was standing backstage, you know. I didn't didn't really know what was going on. So one day I get, Alan came up to me, and he said, you know, I've talked to everybody in the band. And nobody wants to do it, so I'm going to ask you. He says, I've, I've talked to Bob Shane, and he said it's okay. Uh, but I've got these CDs and tapes. And if you sell them at the concert, you can, you can make money. And you don't, have to, you don't have to put out your own CD or anything. All you got to do is buy them from me, put them up on a table, and people buy them. And you can charge, like if I, if I sell it to you for 8 bucks, you can sell it for 20 bucks. Or something like that. I said, okay. Uh, I was never one to, s if somebody comes up with an idea, I, and my wife will attest to this, she goes, learn how to say no. <laughs> learn, learn how to say no once in a while. And, and yes, yes, it is a problem. But so I ordered some CDs from, I go, I don't know, Alan, I don't know what to get. Uh, why don't you just send me a box of whatever you think I'm going to sell. And I'll, um, uh, and then he goes, and I'll send you a bill. You, you sell the CDs, pay me, and keep the rest. And then you can split it with Bob, however. So I went to Bob, and I talked to him about it. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't care. I don't care. And they go, well, uh, well, how much money do you want for me to do it? I mean, I realize that you're, it's your band, and you're flying me there. And... Um, Sometimes you're paying the hotel room. Sometimes that's, you know, you're paying for the rental cars. You're paying for everything. So it's your deal. Uh, I'm going to buy the CDs. I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I'll do all the work and stuff. What do you say we split it 50-50? Uh, I don't care. Uh, I don't, man. It's like uh, if you knew Bob Shane, you'd know that he'd talk like that. But he I, – I love Bob – and by the way, I, I, no disrespect – to uh, the great Bob Shane because he was he was one of the greatest vocalists I've ever worked with and uh, um, he was also he taught me a lot about life and he was kind of like a second dad to me in a way and so he uh, uh, he said sure so the first night uh, we were down in Riverside California and we did this concert at the beautiful theater and I went to the people and I said in a theater and I said I've got these CDs to sell do you have anybody to consult for me because uh, they go, sure. So, uh, you know, they asked me how much I wanted for them and stuff. And I had this giant box. So I opened the box and I had all these CDs. And then there was this bill for like 900 bucks. I'm going, oh, this is really bad news. Because where am I going to come up with 900 bucks to pay for a bunch of discs and tapes, you know? 
I mean, that seemed ridiculous. So they put all the stuff out for sale, and it all sold. So the 900 bucks turned into like 2,500 bucks or $3,000 minus the percentage to the theater. So I went to Bob, and of course, everybody in the band had heard, had seen what was going on because somebody came back going, "Do you have any more CDs?" Uh, you know, we're all in the green room, and they're, "Do you have any more CDs?" Because we're we're like out, and it's only intermission. I go, "I don't know." This, this. And, every, and everybody in the band who had been turned down this offer were like starting to get a little, you know, jiggy around me, like, "Oh yeah, well, uh, you know, what are you selling?" You know, getting all getting all interested, and I go, I thought you guys said you didn't want to do this. But uh, by the time I'd been doing this a few years, so I already knew the guys, and I knew their impulses. And um, and uh, so we, uh, I already felt the sense that I had to start smoothing things out. <laughs> so I counted up everything that I needed to do, and I gave Bob 50%, and, uh, and, uh, I've never seen him so unhappy in his life because here, was, here from my perspective, <laughs> I thought, oh, I'm doing a really great thing. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, uh, I'm the one musician in his life that's actually making him money. Everybody else is costing him money. There's like a whole room full of guys here that all he's got, he's writing paychecks for. I'm the one guy that's making him money. And so I thought I'm doing a great service, but, uh, there was a lot of there were a lot of emotions about the recordings that they made. Each recording to to those guys was what had a lot of memories and a lot of emotions attached to each recording. So every recording that was put up for sale was uh, a thing to them. I mean, it wasn't just a recording; it was like a a big deal. And there were some bootlegs out there that that Alan Shaw was selling that. Bob Shane knew about, and he didn't didn't want anything to do about. It. So the Kings of Trio started getting bootlegged big time. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of problems, you know. So I started learning about, you know, that not only are these CDs, but these are this is this is part of their their essence, you know, as a human being. Well, that's a hard thing because you yeah. don't know what you don't know until you you don't know yeah. what you don't know, and. Uh, it was a great lesson for me to 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 uh, actually get a little bit more introspective with the artists about uh, what these CDs meant for them, and I learned a lot about how they went about recording them and stuff. You know, a lot of time had passed by the time they had made those recordings, so uh, uh, I didn't really want to get in their face about it. But I wanted to know. And Nick Reynolds was a great resource because he, we would ride in the same car. And I drove him. And we spent thousands of hours together uh, talking about the music industry and the recordings and how they went about them and, and stuff. And uh, uh, Nick was a little more aloof. Uh, but Bob was the lead singer. And so a lot of these recordings were definitely his. He really had strong emotions about them. Uh, and which, which uh, in turn led to a superior music performance from him, even though he was off the cuff and you thought he didn't care about anything. Uh, if I was with Bob and somebody was on TV singing, uh, he would start yelling at the TV going, oh, those guys don't even know the lyrics that they're talking about, you know? I mean, he, he could hear it right away. He, he was... It was a great experience, but in the long run, uh, that was a part of my life. And the rest of the time, I was that was that was a maybe a, in the beginning, it was about a third of the time of my year, and the rest of the time I was back in Seattle. Uh, and then, as the years went by, it, it, the Kings and Trio's time on the road shrunk a little bit more. As long as Bob and Nick were in the group, they had lots of work because they're two original guys. But then I uh, uh, would come back to Seattle, and the first thing I would do every time I came home, I would go down and hang out somewhere. I mean, the, because in the music world, if you tell somebody you're going out of town, 
They think you're gone. They think you moved, right? You're like, oh, I thought you were going out of town. And I go, I did. <laughs> I went to Baltimore, and I'm, now I'm back. You know, and they're like, oh, uh, okay. Well, Paul's here. And then the phone would ring, you know, and I'd get a call for a gig. So this was this is kind of how well, a little bit how I managed. So I came home, and I was really tired, uh, and I just wanted to stay home. Uh, my, I wouldn't get any call. But so what I had to do is drag my sorry ass out and on a Sunday night or a, a Monday night, usually Sunday night jam session somewhere. And I started doing the jam session Sunday nights with Mark Seals down at Tula's. And uh, uh, that was good because I got to play all the time with Mark. And Steve Korn was playing drums, so they had a great drummer. And um, lots of people came in. I started playing with uh, other guys. I got to uh, hung out with uh, Rick Mandyke and John Bishop a lot. And I got to play with them. In, and uh, they were doing a trio with Jeff Johnson. And whenever Jeff, and he was extremely busy, so... Thankfully, uh, when he couldn't play with them, they would call me. And I was like, why? I have no idea why they're calling me, but uh, I'm going to take it anyway. So um, so that's kind of how I did it. And so over the years, uh, I started playing with Jay Thomas a lot, and he taught me a lot. And uh, he had John Hansen and John Weekon were playing with him. So I learned a lot from those guys. That's where I first, I think, started noticing you because that was a, a, what you mentioned a little before my time. But when I first started really getting into jazz and like the local scene and getting up to Seattle, uh -huh. like Jay's band and you were playing with Jay, that was kind of where I first met you, if I remember correctly, yeah. somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah, that was that was fun, and uh, that was a fun group, and I I learned a lot uh, playing with those guys, and uh, you know how us musicians are, we we all talk about the recordings we're listening to or uh, what to avoid or, you know. And Jay, of course, is a great resource because uh, every time I turn around, he's like, oh, man, you got to check out this recording. you got to check out this solo or, you know. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is what I want. This is what I want in my life is people like this, people that are really excited about music. You know, even if it's like, oh, you got to check out Bill Monroe singing this song or just like people that really love music not people who don't that that just play and are, are kind of not interested but people like jay or uh i mean i can't i can't think of a musician that i play with now that isn't super excited about music which is great i mean this is this is uh this is what i love about it you know i get i've got a bunch of bass player friends now uh who are all uh, better bass players than I am, as far as I'm concerned, and they and they all are crazy in love with music. I yeah. hear what you're saying. I would. Mm, everybody plays very, very well, and everybody plays very, very differently. You're playing yourself, right? I can't remember who. If it, I remember there was a, um, I think a study. I think it was uh, a, a student, but they were basically analyzing different musicians and the way that they talked as people and the way that they played and you can kind of see the personality in their playing so i mean yeah we all have our own kind of oh, things of but right. don't sell yourself short you're oh, a tremendous I'm, bassist I'm, stop I'm, it I'm, yeah I'm, I'm 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 decent i mean you know i practice a lot i practice you know practice a lot and uh um definitely uh i'm cl still trying to climb the mountain or set up a base camp somewhere you know, on my way up the mountain. And, uh, but I guess the main point was that through this, all this Kinks and Trio stuff, I I I got to um, have a, a part-time job that wasn't just a job. It was, it was like playing with a, a real musical entity. And then whether it's jazz or not, I, you know, uh, I suppose if I went out on the road with uh, uh, somebody else that was a different, genre it might have might have had a different thing but you know the kings of trio is a name everybody knows i i, I had lots of musicians go oh you play with the kings of trio that's great and they'd name off some song i go that's not a kings of trio song <laughs> but you know what they know the name of the kings of trio that yeah. it's like the most famous group that you don't know what they did you know kind of thing it's like uh 
but that's okay. That's a great place to live, you know, for them. And uh, they've got some other musicians doing the gig now, and uh, uh, so they're they're often doing it. I, I don't want to travel with them anymore, so I we said we parted ways, and uh, so now I'm just a full time guy, and I like I like teaching the bass, and I like playing playing it around here, and I I love uh, I love how s I how I sound uh, with. The each musician that I play with, I sound different with each one. It's like a, it's like having a conversation with somebody, and the and the better you get, so it's never it's never like I'm I'm never in a position to uh, make myself. Uh, I, I've never been one that that has an ideal uh, group of people in mind, because it, to me it's always a it's always a different. Uh, thing. It's like going to a uh, uh, having lunch with different people, you know. And, and each time you have a different conversation. Somebody may be focused on uh, politics. Somebody may be focused on running shoes. Somebody might, you know. You never know what conversation you're going to have. Uh, and uh, so it's it's all uh, it's an amazing journey. It really is. And and all through that, I I. I'm fortunate that I get to be part of it, you know. I want to, um, while we still have some time here, I know we started a little late, but we'll, okay. we'll go a little over. That's um, my fault, by the way. No, 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 no. Um, so I have several questions, and I, I guess I want to start with, because I know uh, also at the time you were playing with Jay, and roughly around that area, if I remember correctly, if memory serves me correctly, um, you were going back and forth to New York quite a bit, like splitting time between New York and Seattle and playing with a lot of great musicians there. Um, and I think through you is where I met uh, John Gordon, I believe. Yeah. Um, Saxophone John Gordon. But um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I wasn't really going back and forth. I had actually moved to New York. Yeah. Now, I, ha I still had my house in Seattle, so I rented it out. Yeah. But I, um, uh, and I, and, and of course, being in New York is like most musicians in New York, they have New York life and then they have the life that they came from. And a lot of people will go back to where they came from to play gigs because the gigs are there and the gigs may not be happening in New York. Now, there are some people that have, uh, friends of mine who moved to New York and that was it. That w they, they're not going anywhere. But, you know, I have a friend in New York from San Francisco who's been there for 30 years now, but he still loves to go back to San Francisco and play with the guys he knows there. So I went to New York. Uh, I moved there. Uh, John John Weekon and Tom Marriott needed a roommate, so John called me up and goes, "Hey, man," <laughs> 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 and I was like, "You know, we need. It. You want to move to New York?" And I was outside. I was outside on my house, like uh, scraping paint or something. You know, like I was trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know my. Uh, a relationship I was in had had ended uh, a few years before my mom passed away, and then like a a year before, or half a year before my father passed away, and and I, I was sitting there thinking, you know, during the phone call, I was going, you know, I've always wanted to go to New York. I mean, I went there for a year back in 1990, but I chickened out, and came back, but I. Um, I just said, okay, what do you need from me, you know? So I sent him some money. This was like uh, the uh, right before 9-11. So this was like uh, September, I started renting. I gave him, I hadn't moved there, and then 9-11 uh, happened. So it took me a few more months to move there from there. I went and visited, but... Um, took some bass there and dropped it off in, in the apartment. And, um, so I was kind of there. I'd found a woman to rent my house, and uh, so it wasn't my house anymore. And I went and lived in this apartment with cockroaches and, and Egyptian music downstairs, and John Weekon yeah. was in the, in the apartment, which was like a huge presence. And Tom Marriott, who was hilarious and laughing all the time. And, and here I am, like... In New York, uh, I knew I knew some people, and but I was confronted with my my own experience of going, 
okay, do I dig in or do I make some popcorn and check it out, watch, <laughs> watch a movie? You know, so the first thing I did is I made some popcorn and watched some movies. <laughs> it's set, you know, went to a movie or something like that. And then, and then, uh, oh, it was so funny. New York was so great. I, I, I still want to go back. I, I loved it there. It's such a great city. And the funniest things happen. I, just the silliest things. I got, but I wish I could talk about them all. I know we have limited time, but the, the, um, uh, the music thing was great. I got I met John Gordon uh, through John uh, and Ingrid Jensen, and th he needed somebody to rent an apartment that he had just bought. And so uh, this is how we met. I didn't meet him musically, but we were driving up there, and I'm going uh, driving up to the apartment up in Harlem to look at it. And uh, so we got talking, and I'm like, "Well, we should we should do something." We should put something together. I'll bring you out to Seattle or something. He's like, sure. sure. Okay, great. Uh, and then, of course, I did some jam sessions. Uh, Mark Ferber was, and I go, uh, I was talking to John Gordon. He goes, oh, I love Mark Ferber. He goes, he's going he's to be in L.A. at the time. Uh, we'll put this thing together. Why don't, why don't we get him to play drums? He'll come up to Seattle. And, and I go, okay, we'll get, we'll get Mark. I go, wow, this is great. Mark Ferber? John Gordon, and I and I met David Budway at a jam session with D Jeff Tane Watts at a band, so I got up and uh, played with John Weekon, uh, and we we were just at this jam session place called the Decade, and and it was uh, Tane's band uh, with uh, Paul Bolenbach and Eric Revis and all the guys, and so we're I'm sitting out there just going, oh my gosh, listen to these guys, incredible. And so they start the jam session. And of course, everybody in the band jumps off the stage. Yeah. You know, they, n they don't want anything to do with the jam <laughs> session. They, you know, the only, the only thing that they wanted to do with the jam session was leave their instruments on the stage so other people could play them. Yeah. And then they could go have a drink or stand on the back wall or, you know. Um, so we started playing. Uh, and I got done with the tune, and, and Jeff Tane Watts jumped jumps up on stage and he goes, uh, who are you and where are you from? And, it's what and he's like, man, that was really swinging. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. He must have been talking about John Weekend because I, John was killing it on the drums. And I was like, uh, I don't know. But I got off the stage and everybody was like talking to me too. Um, and I met David Budway, who is just a, a phenomenal human being and uh, one of the most gifted musicians not saying he doesn't work at it because he really works at it, but he he can play drums, he can play guitar, he can play piano, he sings, he does everything. I mean, I saw a recording of him playing drums with. Uh, do we have enough time? Uh, almost, almost done. <laughs> My little David Budway story. I was watching. Uh, I he 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 got me some great gigs, yeah. and um, uh, I used to play with him at this place called Brand, uh, Brandy's which was up on East 84th. And everybody went up there to hang out and watch Budway because he's a freak of nature. When he came, he'd be singing and playing the piano. And uh, it sounded like an orchestra on this old piano. And one time he was playing it, and there was a sound. And he was like, what is an upright piano? He puts the lid, and he reaches in, and he pulls a string out. And he's like, <laughs> like this. And he's like playing, you know, and we're all, we're all just amazed. So he asked me to come in and start doing a jazz night with him. Yeah. Um, so once a week, I did that for a while. And then he hired me to, to come out and play with him uh, for a few uh, weeks at the Carlisle with him and Ron Afif, which was great. Yeah. And then uh, uh, when Ron couldn't do it, uh, 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 Mark, uh, oh boy, sorry, internet, I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll think of the name in a minute. You, we can add it in the comments later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, this is this is the 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 part where you get older and you can't remember names. But uh, so I got to play with some great musicians in New York. And the thing I loved about New York was that, from a Seattle perspective, there's a bunch of musicians that are famous, or you want to attain that. But when you're in New York, there's all kinds of musicians you don't know about 
that aren't on that national level scene, but they're just as good of musicians. Yeah. And, they, and they're doing all kinds of, of music. Uh, it's incredible. It's incredible that most of these people have given up everything in their lives to go to New York to do the one thing they want to do. And so it's, it's a really great town. And the people are friendly uh, for the most part. The musicians are, are great, and they all want to play. They all want to gig. And uh, each one of them has, like, this depth and breadth of knowledge that uh, is you can, you can go after if you just sit around and talk to them, you know. Uh, we're definitely have to get because we only got like that much. I've okay. got several other questions. Yeah. So we'll have to do another one. Um, before we wrap up here, I want to ask you because I ask all the guests this: um, being the musician that you are now, with all the tremendous experiences and and great musicians that you've worked with and places that you've seen and gone and things that you've done, uh, if you were going to impart some advice to someone who's thinking about uh, undertaking becoming a musician or continuing on with music. Um, what are some things that you found personally very helpful and useful in your personal growth and development as a musician that you would impart to them? Ooh. Hmm. I'll ponder that with a sip of coffee. <laughs> well, I think the most important thing is to, um, uh, as we all say, uh, practice when you don't want to. You know, find a way to dedicate some time, even if you don't want to do it, to go and work out. It's like working out or whatever. You know, it's raining. You're, you're dedicated to running. It's raining. You just go out and, you know. And if you hate it, do it without a raincoat. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you, if you hate it, then do it so it's really super uncomfortable until you, you, can, you can beat the odds. Because... Practicing as a musician, for some people, it may be just the, the most joyous experience in the world. I haven't found that at playing the upright bass. Is sometimes it's joyous, and sometimes it's just a lot of work. As Buddy Catlett, uh, who I took some lessons with, he would say, you know, some days the bass feels like butter, and sometimes it feels like you're playing barbed wire, <laughs> you know? But you just got to keep at it. And, that, and so that's one of the things is keep at it. Find find somebody not necessarily a friend uh find somebody that is a that can become a mentor somebody that you that you either trust or somebody that you just aspire to and uh go after them even if it seems unattainable you know i mean it may not be herbie hancock but it it could be you know uh and you don't even have to let them know you know just uh Try to be involved in their life, you know, and then uh, uh, find a few teachers and then uh, listen to lots of music, you know. That, that's the beginning. And then, but th just start hanging out because mu music, unless you're a great solo soloist, I mean, it's all, it's all networking. So the more you can hang out, uh, the better chances of something happen. So the... The people in the in the uh, that aspiring actors and stuff get jobs on the soundstage so they can be close, because you're never going to get that acting job by just auditioning. But if you're hanging out and you're running coffee to the producer or the director, and then they they look at you and they go, you know, I never really looked at you before, but you look like you'd fit into the this thing, you know. You got to be available. So, if you can, you know, even if it's somebody that you uh, you want, you feel like you're in competition with, or something. Don't. That's another thing. Don't be in competition with everybody. Don't think that somebody you should have a gig that they have, because they got the gig. Somebody called them for a good reason, and they they didn't not call you. Because that's not how it works. They called this person and uh, for the gig. It isn't because it, 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 you know they go, oh, yeah, I, I hate Paul Gabrielson or I hate so-and-so. It's just they go, I really like this other – I think this person would work well. Or, I, or 
Uh, no disrespect, guys, but this is the sound I'm looking for. Uh, find those people and and make friends with them, and make friend. You know, know it, it's a community, community effort, and get involved with everything you can. I mean, that's that's the secret to success. Now, whether uh, my success or not, but uh, and then you know, try to have a little sense of humor about the whole thing because you kind of have to, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's uh, uh, the most successful guys I know are are kind of a little more relaxed and they they got good jokes. They're funny, you know. Um, uh, some people are savants and uh, they remember everything, and but just try to find good and find find the good in in the ones that you you even think you're locking horns with because everybody has something good to share and uh, uh, I've, I've learned a lot from some wonderful musicians and I still am you know I wish I could name everybody here but I, I comments <laughs> you know, I, I, I love you all you know you know who you are you know um, uh, so any other questions or no no that's it for now um so what i would say is um uh, thank you all of us for uh, thank oh you yeah, all of us. thank you for watching everybody. thank you paul for joining us um stick around we're going to take a brief intermission here um and then we are going to kind of reconfigure and matt jorgens is going to join us we'll do a concert with a bunch of brand new uh music that we've never played before and uh yeah so um and again if you have any questions um i didn't see any come through but sometimes my phone drops them but if you have questions put them in the comments and we will um get to them after the broadcast if we can so paul thanks for joining us it's been a pleasure oh, you're welcome it's great one moment